Thanks for joining us on 9 News Plus. I'm Chris Bianchi. As we tape this late on Tuesday night, it appears that Mike Johnston is comfortably heading towards becoming Denver's next mayor. For more on what Johnston's likely election means, we're now joined by outgoing city councilwoman Robin Kanish and longtime Denver elections official Alton Dillard. Thanks to both of you for joining us here on 9 News Plus. And first of all, and Robin, I'll start with you here. Uh, Overall, 30,000 foot takeaway from what we've seen here on Tuesday night, what it means for the future of the city of Denver. I think we saw an election uh, between a visionary and a manager, and we saw a difference in records. And I think the voters really picked the visionary and a record that kind of aligned with the history of Denver and with some of the values of the city. And I think that we see that that mayor is going to have to face a whole bunch of challenges and face up to some big promises that he's made. And that is going to be a challenge for him. He's going to have to deal with some credibility questions when those promises face the realities of the city. But I think that we are going to be debating a lot the role of money in the race. And we'll have some discussion about that real shortly, I'm guessing. Yeah. And, and, and Robin, I should clarify, too, that you're I think alluding to the fact that Johnson promising to end homelessness within his first term, the first four years, which is uh, quite a tall task here in the city of Denver. But uh, Alton, I kind of want to post that, that same question to you. What are your top takeaways from what we saw here Tuesday night? My top takeaways is I just think the city seemed to be ready for a different trajectory. And again, this is no shade on, you know, Hickenlooper, no shade on Hancock, but that was a total of 20 years of kind of a status quo. So to use your terminology, yeah, there is definitely a vision. And to your point, it's going to be interesting to see if it gets executed because government is a bit of a grind. Municipal government, things move slowly. And I have friends who are in the entrepreneurial space who tried working for government. And then when they found out that it's harder to get 50 bucks out of your office manager than it is to move a $2 million contract, they're like, oh, this isn't for me. You know, to, <laughs> let me see if I have this straight. It has to get signed off here, here, go across the street, come back. Uh, no. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> That's super interesting. That's a really uh, unique way to look at it for, uh, I'm sure, a lot of you at home. But that mm. is a perspective I'm certainly not familiar with. But um, I guess, Robin, going over to you, what do you think you mentioned visionary versus maybe a perception of status quo, perhaps? What do you think ultimately was the difference, assuming Johnson comes away with a comfortable margin and why he was able to win by a rather decisive margin? You know, people are going to talk about the money in this race, and it was real and obviously concerning on both sides magnitude for sure concerning on the Johnson side. But money buys you repetition. It doesn't necessarily buy you the message you're delivering. And in hmm. this case, the message that Johnson's uh, independent expenditures delivered was the record that Bruff had for 20 years. And I think that, you know, you can cry sour grapes, which she and her independent expenditures did. But the truth is she did not use those 20 years to spend uh, money or effort or policy on housing. She didn't spend it on homelessness. No one knows what's in her heart. No one knows what's in her values. Hmm. But that record was there for the taking. And the money didn't make that record. It just simply repeated it over and over. The question is, did Kelly Bruff have the money to get her message out there? And she did. So the voters had that message out there. They didn't have as much repetition of it. But I don't think we can say the voters of Denver didn't know Kelly Bruff. The voters of Denver didn't have exposure to her story. They did. And they chose the other story and they chose the other message. So I think money, maybe that repetition has an effect. We know that research wise, mm -hmm. but I don't think we can say the voters didn't have enough of Kelly's message. So I want to give the voters some credit here. They have chosen candidates in the at-large races who got outspent. Mm -hmm. They are capable of making those nuanced decisions and not just you know going with the biggest bucks in a race. So I want to be careful about just assuming that, that whoever has the most bucks win. Our voters are a little more, more intelligent than that. Interesting. I'll yeah, I want to piggyback off of that on a couple of the points. One, is we talked about, you know, sort of the role of endorsements and the role of repetition, but also think about uh, Kelly Bruff and her ties to the chamber. People forget that she had a stint in academia between then and now. 
but she's mm. inextricably tied to the chamber. Another thing that I thought was interesting, this is a nonpartisan election, but her 527 ad subliminally mentioned her being a Democrat when they tag out of the ad. And I wonder if that was attempt to sort of blunt any fire that may be going on because of her being endorsed by the Denver Republican Party. Yeah, interesting. And let's get into some of those endorsements uh, because that may have played a role in some cases. Uh, Mike Johnson, maybe rather tepidly endorsed by Lisa Calderon and Leslie Herod, uh, obviously a little further to his left. Uh, you mentioned all in the endorsement that came from the Denver Republican Party, from law enforcement, maybe a bit more center, center right, perhaps even um, endorsements. Robin, what role do you think endorsements played in this race? You know, we have an old saying in politics that endorsements don't win elections, but they can provide signals for voters who are confused. And I think many of us described these candidates coming out of that general election in April as moderates, similar. There were voters wishing that they had more choices. Even with, even with 18, 17 candidates, they still wanted more choices. And so what endorsements did when they started to come out was they gave some signals. Oh, maybe they're not identical. Um, maybe it's okay for me to vote. Some people were thinking they needed to stay at home because there was no, you know, good choice or it wasn't the right thing to do to pick one of these candidates mm. and so it made it okay to get in there and vote so i think some signals did help loosen some things up major um labor unions that uh particularly for mike johnston the largest and most progressive unions in the state and in denver got on board in his campaign they brought resources they didn't just bring um signals to voters they actually brought uh voter uh, turnout they brought calls to their members and calls to voters so they bring resources sometimes yeah, and then the other thing about endorsements is, you know, Denver is becoming a younger and younger city. So let's, you know, eliminate the fact that the 65 and up is that top voting demographic. But when it comes to the population demographic, it's skewing younger and younger. We have people of voting age now who don't remember Federico Pena as a mayor or Wellington Webb as a mayor or you know, even Bill Ritter as a governor or a yeah. district attorney. And so I was always curious about you know, what potential weight these endorsements had. So of course, me being a you know, true centrist, true unaffiliated, I'm really sort of keeping an eye on how the community, even though this wasn't a hugely contentious race, how it heals. Because there are people in both mm. camps that I know very well and I've been, you know, I keep an ear on Brother Jeff. I keep an ear on a lot of things that go on in the community. And there were some very interesting last minute pitches um, on both sides of this race. And so I'm really just going to be interested in seeing that. And then just like Council Member Kanish here, we talked about the mechanics of the city. Who is going to get in these appointed slots that's actually going to do the day-to-day -day lift of running the city. The mayor's the CEO. And so Kyle was hilarious on his segment last night where he referred to the watch parties as job fairs. So I will certainly be keeping an eye on that. Okay, well, let's, let's lead into that. So let's, let's start looking forward as to what a potential Mike Johnson administration would look like. What are some of those key cabinet positions that you think could be potentially up for grabs? Well, the key job is really not in the cabinet, it's your chief of staff. Yes. And it's often an invisible job. You don't see them very often. If they're doing their job right, they are handling problems, they're managing those uh, cabinet positions uh, and doing a lot of the mechanics of the city. It's the job Kelly Bruff, of course, did. So, um, you know, and any good candidate at this level of the game has some ideas who they might hire. And if they're saying they didn't, well, I'm concerned. <laughs> um, you know, other key appointments, really community planning and development, that was an obsession for both these candidates, getting the permitting office. And mm -hmm. so I think this is the balance. Do you want local knowledge of understanding how these agencies work, someone who understands the local regulations, or do you want your best and brightest from your national network of Yale and Harvard graduates, right? 
These are gonna be tough choices. Hmm. If you hire all from the outside and you have no knowledge of where those checks get signed and how the city works, you're gonna be at a disadvantage. You wanna get the morale of the city employees. You wanna have trust and buy-in. So you gotta really balance that talent pool with the local knowledge. Agreed. And, you know, I also was thinking of the uh, alarm that uh, Mayor Webb raised when it came about, what, a week, week and a half ago. He expressed concerns about the loss of appointees of color in some pretty key places. But, you know, and you can probably, you know, help me out with this. Occasionally, there's people who get carried over from administration to administration, but if there's only, what, total of 50-ish appointments, it could be a total house cleaning or there could be, you know, hey, this person has done such a great job here. They've got the community contacts or whatever. So in these key areas, maybe we won't be starting from scratch if we continue someone over. Or there's also the uh, possibility that someone who's currently at the appointed level could revert to a career service level position. And then that knowledge can still be tapped. Absolutely fascinating. I kind of want to move on here a little bit to the impact of the Fair Elections Fund. First, mayoral election uh, that we've had with the Fair Elections Fund. How do you think it impacted the race? Um, obviously, you mentioned the influence of money in both the Johnson and Bruff campus camps, but how did it impact the races here? On the Fair Elections Fund, I did notice that there was a lot of hand wringing that the two most money candidates also pulled the most taxpayer dollars. Hmm. And I just always, that discussion always is so interesting to me. I was someone who was on Capitol Hill during the passage of McCain-Feingold. So I have seen the attempts to quote unquote, keep money out of politics, even leading up to decisions like Citizens United and things like that. At the local level, I think it had a bit of the desired effect as far as opening up the ability, and that's one of the things I think that it helped lead to that large field along with Denver's ridiculously low signature thresholds. I gotta go on record <laughs> with that. But I also think there are some potential unintended consequences. So one thing I always like to clarify, the Fair Elections Fund was a citizen initiative. It was not a program just created by the city and county of Denver. I like to contrast it with uh, Green Roofs initiative. Green Roofs was not expected to pass. It was a Red Robin manager facing off against the well-heeled developers. He won, next thing you know, it's like, oh God, we have to come up with a program. At least on the Fair Elections Fund, there was a front side stakeholdering process where people were brought in, including the people who crafted the citizens legislation to be able to have those discussions. Okay. Robin? I think it's clearly beneficial for bringing in some council candidates and allowing them to compete. These are hard races to raise money for. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to see less developer money in city elections, but you know what's really interesting? There's not a huge pool of donors in these worlds. Regular people do give $25 and $50 mm -hmm. donations, but that does not help you um, get to a citywide race for at-large, for example, mm -hmm. to the rate you need to to reach voters. And so so if you don't want developer money in these races, you've got to have public financing. There's just no question. At the mayoral level, the question is, of course, the biggest raiser is going to get the biggest match. Do we have the stomach for matching really wealthy candidates who also have outside spending mm -hmm. in order to be able to get the money to the council races that really need them? That's the question. Well, kind of speaking of which, let's go to the city council races for a quick second here. Mm -hmm. A couple of the races still quite in question, but I would say it's safe to say, as we tape this on Tuesday night, mm -hmm. that it appears that Candy City Baca heading for a, a pretty sizable defeat to Daryl Watson, who, as we spoke of this, had already um, delivered his victory speech. So it appears pretty likely that he's going to win. What does this mean from a broader perspective for progressives in the city? Is this a defeat for progressives in the city, considering that they didn't get a single candidate to the runoff and they lose Candy City Baca with the asterisk, noted asterisk, that there could be a couple progressives that get into uh, win a couple of the races tonight. We got to be real careful with this term progressive. You know, um, the 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 Democratic Socialists of America is a brand name of a very small unstaffed organization with very few resources. And somehow it's become conflated with this term progressive. 
In fact, Daryl Watson would be the first African-American out um, gay man elected to the Denver City Council. He was actually endorsed by Progressive Democrats of America, which is a national organization affiliated with Bernie Sanders. <laughs> His positions <laughs> met the test of a Bernie Sanders organization. So is the okay. city council going to be swinging to the right? Land use is a real tough issue to determine progressive or conservative. Are you progressive if you believe in density? Or are you progressive if you believe in stopping development? Those mm -hmm. are real tough lines to draw, right? We don't have the same types of pro-choice, anti-gun, you know, pro-LGBTQ rights issues, divide, you know, so it's, it's a much more messy way to divide your politics. Mm. I would say the city of Denver was progressive yesterday. It is progressive today. And candidates on land use issues will be elected who had some developer support. If you think that means it's a little less progressive than it would have if Candy C. DeBach had been elected, great. But I don't think you're going to see conservative legislation advancing in the Denver City Council anytime soon. <laughs> All right, Alton? Yeah, and my take on that is just the fact that, you know, you have to, uh, again, I know we're talking about the city council level, but go back to the top ticket driver of the mayoral race and so it's you know you speculate on where progressive is or isn't as far as the vision of the city going forward but the fact that uh, Lisa Calderon was like you said a tepid endorsement but it was an endorsement of you know Mike Johnston you have to think again about a candidate who was backed by law enforcement and backed by the Republican Party. Um, the other thing to note is that when it comes to the you know, term progressive, we do have two progressives who were elected to the Denver City Council at large seats. And you know, remember, that is a one and done. There's no runoff in that race. So those two candidates garnered a total of 36% of the vote. So that's not exactly what I would call a sweeping mandate. But Denver is always going to be a centrist city. Denver is always going to be a sort of play it down the middle of the road city. And so it's going to be interesting watching however this council cake is finally baked, how they work with Johnston in a uh, strong mayor form of government. Fascinating takeaways there. Um, any final big takeaways before we get out of here? Hey, kudos to these voters. Every time we have one of these, um, you know, municipal elections, it is always difficult to get turnout and we worry that, you know, will enough voters turn out? And we always want more voters to turn out. But for those of you who did, this is your election. It doesn't belong to these candidates. It doesn't belong to these independent expenditure committees. It belongs to you. And, you know, these are your leaders. And I think that the question of how any of these candidates, the mayors, the city council, how they'll succeed, it depends on the people of Denver. Mayor Hancock wasn't going to support the minimum wage. He wasn't going to support, um, you know, safe outdoor spaces. There were a number of things that he evolved on because the people of Denver were moving towards these solutions. They were supportive of them. The city council was supportive of them. This city is dynamic and mm -hmm. your mayor, your council will be as progressive or as supportive of the issues as the people of Denver will be. And that's the takeaway. All right. Voters, your election, oh, what's your takeaway? Uh, yeah, it does come down to the people. And I'm one of those people who's just politically naive enough to separate politics from governance. Hmm. Once this election is over, it doesn't make any difference who's in that mayor seat or who's in those city council seats. You are a constituent of theirs. And so I've always been a big believer. You have your voice heard at the ballot box but you also need to make your voice heard when someone skids down the ice and runs over the stop sign on your corner by calling 311 or calling your city council member if you don't think you're being responded to quickly enough. And that's why I'm a big believer that we need to participate in all elections. Yeah, I said this earlier, we get all hopped up about presidential elections, Senate elections, congressional elections, but the rubber meets the road on your street corner. All right. Fascinating. Absolutely. But uh, Robin uh, Alton, appreciate the immense of your time, lending us your expertise and some of those takeaways with the, again, want to repeat, <laughs> repeat. asterisks, <laughs> asterisks 
here that Mike Johnson comes away with the victory as the mayor, the next mayor of Denver. First new mayor, by the way, of course, since 2011. Uh, he would take office on July the 17th. Mm -hmm. And meantime, again, Robin, Alton, appreciate a few minutes of your time here on 90s Plus. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.